Okay, welcome back everyone. I make it 20, 20 past one. Um, can we check with uh, Marco and Fraser that all our connections are now working? Can everyone hear me? As far as I'm aware, Provost. And have we lost anybody? Everyone seems to be in back in attendance. Okay, we're uh, continuing the discussion of Blencourse Primary School, page 168. And I think it was next up for uh, Councillor Curran to uh, join the debate. And then Janet Lee Douglas. So, Provost, I was just raising their technical issues. So. Fine. Uh, Councillor Lee Douglas. Thank you, Provost. Um, I actually just want to, um, I'm not going to repeat what Councillor Muirhead has covered. Um, I think Councillor Hackett and Alexander made some very extremely relevant points. Um, and I just would like to say that I would like to support this paper on those on that basis. And um, I'm glad that the cross party working group are all supporting this as throughout the process we've been extremely well informed and, and kept in the loop by the by education. OK, uh, there being no further comments. Uh, I sense that any sort of middle ground involving a review before we come to this decision is not gaining much traction. So it's a really sort of binary thing as to whether uh, people are going to vote in favour of the uh, decision to close with full consultation or vote against it. And I think that means a roll call vote. Um, is that right, Mr. Turpey? It's a vote as per a roll call. It's not a roll call vote in itself, but in order to be sure everyone's vote is voted correctly, we will run it as if it were a roll call vote. So everyone will be asked to vote, but it won't be recorded against their names. It's just to make sure that Fiona and our team can get the numbers right. As we've seen today, if the hands the hands up signal isn't always clear. Speaking of which, Provost, I think councillors Wallace, Johnston and Parry have all raised Indeed their they hands. Councillor Wallace. I've Thanks, Provost. Um, I would just want to find out who is uh, who gets involved in the consultation process. Is it just the parents, or is it a wider community uh, of the whole area? Uh, Alan Turpey might be familiar with the procedures. I would certainly. I don't know if Sandra Banks is still at the meeting. I'd certainly defer to her. Uh Chair, Andrew. but from my own my past experience, as I recall, it would be parents of pupils currently at the school and those who would be likely to attend within the next two years. Uh, yes, and, it, and sorry, Sandra. Yes, it, and and um, it will go quite a lot wider than that. We will the we'll consult with all interested parties. So the the group that Alan has described. Obviously, the staff of the staff of the school, um, community representatives of all sorts. We will also include in the consultation um, the the similar communities of the schools that will be affected by extending their catchments. So it will be quite a wide consultation in terms of the area that it will cover. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Johnston, and then Councillor Parry. Uh, Joe Wallace has asked. The question I was interested in. That's fine. Thank you. That's why I reduced my hand, re lowered my hand. Councillor Parry. Uh, thanks, Provost. I was just going to ask if we could have it minuted as a roll call vote as well as having a roll call vote. Alan Turkey, I believe that that is possible under the instructions I read out at the beginning of the meeting. The member has to be successful in moving a roll call vote in terms of standing orders. Does that mean a seconder? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyone want to... yeah. We need a seconder for uh, Councillor Parry's uh, call for a formal roll call vote. In other words, your vote will be recorded. Seconded, uh, seconded by Councillor Alexander. Councillor McCall. Councillor McCall. Seconded. Uh, Councillor McCall. OK. Can I ask uh, Verona or is it Gordon, therefore, to formally proceed with the roll call? Sorry, Chair, Chair it's not quite that straightforward. <laughs> Tell me about Bear it. Bear with me, I'm going to get the precise reference to it from. Well, 
We're going to have to have a roll call vote as to whether we we'll have, have a roll, roll call, call vote. vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid so. I know that sounds. Uh... So one one yep. third. Um, one, one, one members. Third, yes, eleven five two. So that. So would how many members do we need? That would be six members would require. Six members to are required. Not just a to okay, so are you going to go through the list until you get to six, and then we can have the vote proper? Is that right? Is that what you want me to do, Provost? If that's in line with standing orders, it sounds to me that it is. We just need to have six. We don't have to go through everybody at this stage. OK. This is in relation to whether you have a roll call vote. A formal in relation... roll call vote in which everyone's voting is recorded. Yeah. Councillor Alexander. Yes, I agree with a roll call. Councillor Baird. Against. Councillor Cassidy. For. Councillor Curran. For. Councillor Hackett. For. Councillor Hardy. For. Councillor Emery. For. We have our six. That's six, Provost. Thank you. We now proceed to the substantive motion, which is as set out on page 168. It's the motion to close Glencore School and have a full consultation. OK, so um, those members in favour of a, the report recommendations, that's the, the mo would be considered to be the motion. So it's either for or against. Councillor Alexander. For. Councillor Baird. Abstain. Councillor Cassidy. For. Councillor Curran. For. Can I just be clear, sorry, for the recommendation, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Hackett. For the recommendations. Councillor Hardy. Against. Councillor Emery. For the recommendation. Councillor Johnston. For the recommendation. Councillor <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Lee Douglas. For all, all the recommendation. Councillor McCall. Against. Councillor Milligan. For the recommendations. Councillor Muirhead. For the recommendations. Councillor Parry. Against the recommendations. Councillor Russell. For the recommendations. Councillor Smeal. Abstain. Councillor Wallace. For. Councillor Winchester. For the recommendation. So 12 for, three against, two abstentions. Thank you all. Now I move to item uh, 817, the Midlothian Climate Change Strategy on page 176. I believe Peter Armstrong is going to speak to this paper. Uh, Provost Peter's not available uh, this oh. afternoon, so uh, Derek Oliver is going to speak to this paper. Derek. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, the purpose of this report is to present a proposed climate change strategy to council for approval 
and publication in response to the Council's declaration of a climate change emergency in December 2019. The strategy sets out a plan, including commitments and actions to deliver the Council's aspiration of being carbon neutral by 2030. The strategy focuses on a number of key themes and um, complements target actions uh, as set out in the action plan in section 3.5. For recommendation, um, the Council is recommended to approve the Climate Change Strategy 2020 and Associated Action Plan, instruct officers to publish the Climate Change Strategy on the Council's website, Note the CMT have committed to resource a dedicated climate change member of staff and agree to the establishment of a climate change board to oversee the implementation of the climate change strategy. Thank you, very succinct. Uh, Councillor Emery. Yeah, th th thanks, Provost. Uh, hopefully we're back on e even ground again after that little bit. Uh, Break away from the the, the normal course. Um, delighted that this uh, th this paper is in front of us today and can be published, hopefully with uh, unanimity uh, on the council's website. Um, if you recall, we, we we signed up to the climate change strategy as a volunteer in two thousand and seven. We then uh, reiterated. Um, as a council, uh, our position in 2014. And after the motion that went through the council last year uh, regarding the climate emergency, it's all now pulled together. There is an absolute uh, support out there within the communities to get something done. And at least Midlothian seems to be at this moment in time uh, leading the way within the Midlothian communities. There's a real hunger uh, to get groups up and running. There's uh, a real engagement. And when you look through the strategy per se and see the amount of work that has been done already by the council and how, how it's now weaved into the normal council uh, agenda and the normal uh, work areas, then it seems to me that we are engaging with the, um, the emergency. We are doing uh, a leadership role across our communities and indeed I'm very pleased that it, it's come this far in such a short time. Um, to get these things off the ground is always difficult. It's always, yeah, yeah, we passed that, that's fine. You know, put, we close the door and that that's us done our little bit. This time round, it really has got some traction. And uh, we saw in an earlier paper today uh, in terms of the house building programme, we're actually now starting to look at a zero carbon uh, household. And, and it just seems to me that's going to tick all the boxes about poverty. It's going to tick all the boxes about heating and lighting. And it just means such a lot for those people that will be eventually moving in to these houses, that they will be really up to such a high standard, a standard that will be internationally acclaimed. And it just gives me great pleasure to support uh, the paper here today. Thanks. Thank you indeed. Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Provost. Yeah, I appreciate the words and I appreciate the, the deeds that Midlothian Council have done, but I wouldn't go patting ourselves too hard on the back at the moment. We lost out on uh, special funding from the Scottish Government to take a cycle initiative, a bicycle initiative in Midlothian just recently during the COVID. Uh, I think that this was a, a terrible missed opportunity. We didn't put forward one single suggestion how we could get people off the roads in their cars and get them on the bikes or get them walking to school. Instead, we threw the money back. East Lothian took it, West Lothian took it, the borders took it, everybody took money this fund except the Northern Council. And we must do better in this time. It's no good sitting patting our back, ourselves on the back with one hand and slapping ourselves on the face with the other. And I'm not trying to be negative, but I have had contact from a, a group of people today called Midlothian Cycling Forum who wish to get Midlothian Council to take up 
the challenge to get people onto bikes and out of cars in Midlothian. And it's been run in East Lothian, it's been run in West Lothian. We're the only people that haven't signed up to it. So let's get our uh, feet on the pedals and get something done. I think you're referring to that headline that said that East Lothian had got five times more than we had. I think we're going for some scooter strategy. Kevin Anderson might be able to uh, speak on this or Derek Oliver. Yes, I'll, I'll come back on that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Um, we put forward uh, a number of uh, options to the Spaces for People programme in line with the active travel strategy. Um, and bearing in mind that the Spaces for People programme was targeted for temporary infrastructure improvements or changes uh, only, not for permanent. Um, there is a, a separate Places for Everyone programme uh, campaign of which we have submitted um, for uh, projects uh, with regarding 20 mile an hour speed limits uh, across our towns uh, and also uh, with village entrances uh, to curtail speed uh, and uh, uh, speeding traffic and to encourage people to take on the active travel route. So we were already um, ahead uh, of where we want to be with regards to the, the active travel strategy uh, of which the, the council had given prior approval. Um, over and above that, we went back with a second phase uh, of bids uh, which were on the back of community consultation. Now, again, this is probably where there's some misconception with regards to the council rejecting particular bids with regards to the Spaces for People programme. Um, it wasn't, it was the Spaces for People, which is operated by Sustrand, um, in line with their strict criteria, again, going back to the temporary infrastructure, it was them who were considering uh, particular projects not to be eligible for, for funding. So Midlothian Council, in terms of proportionality and reasonableness uh, of meeting the eligibility, actually favoured quite well. And going forward, as I say, we also are bidding for places for everyone where we're looking at a place based approach to all our strategies, uh, combining uh, everything from active travel, public transport to align all of these aspects, as well as climate change and then this new climate change strategy to all that we do with regards to housing development, planning uh, and how we undertake our regulatory uh, obligations. OK, so you're saying there's no reason that we can't in future get a fair cut of the funding that's going for green transport initiatives. It, well, I'm, yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm saying, uh, Provost. Uh, what we put forward were um, ways and means to, to bring forward the active travel strategy to, to align itself with the, the temporary funding that was available through the Spaces for, for People programme. And I think that's important to stress that it was the temporary aspects. We, we couldn't go forward with a number of uh, you know, um, initiatives or proposals that the community came forward with uh, or that were included within our active travel because they wouldn't be funded. It had to be, it had to meet the temporary infrastructure eligibility. Councillor Hackett. Thank you, Provost. Um, Mr Oliver said much of what I was going to say there and I know residents were disappointed to see you know Edinburgh and bear in mind Edinburgh were given half the funding available long before uh, many other councils were able to submit a bid. Um, now additional money was uh, released by the Scottish Government um, for the spaces for people funding um, as we were going submitting our bid or almost in the process of submitting our, our bid. Um, as cabinet member that has some responsibility over this area, that was one of the first things we looked at was our existing active travel strategy and reaching out to communities with their ideas. We know there are lots of people out there that do have good ideas. Some of them weren't workable um, at the time, um, but some of them are. Some of them weren't eligible for this funding um, and some of them will be in the future. And this is why on the back of that, I insisted that we look at permanent um, solutions to this problem. I think we'll find with other councils whether it be 20 mile an hour or their cycling lanes or anything else, they were temporary measures. And I don't know about others, but I saw um, certainly in Edinburgh bike lanes with um, street lights bang in the middle of them. You know, and I don't want to see our council doing that type of work. This is about a permanent solution um, to some of these issues, and it is about working much closer with our communities. So I'd like to thank the officers for going straight back to Sustrans and putting in a bid for a permanent solution. 
And I have to say, given some of the criticisms from other councillors, I have to question, what was your involvement? What suggestions did you put forward? Um, and yes, I was disappointed to see other councils get so much more money, but um, myself and other colleagues have been pushing staff, working with them closely to get the right bid in um, that met with the funding criteria and working beyond that to look at permanent solutions that will benefit our county and meet our aspirations under the climate, tra uh, climate change strategy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Milligan. Uh, you're muted, Councillor Milligan. Thanks, Boris. I thought there was a couple of folk in before me, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a technical Thanks. issue here. Uh, if you go first, I think Councillor Alexander. Yes. Since you're online, Derek, could you go first and then Councillor Alexander, and I apologise. Yeah. Uh, um, John's making a good point there uh, um, that, that trying to make sure that elected members are involved. I just wonder actually um, to meet Colin's point uh, and to make sure that elected members are aware of what the criteria is here. Would it be worth setting up a cross-party working group not only to drive um, the climate change agenda um, uh, but also to look and to make sure that we'll have um, off-the-shelf ready projects if there is other fu funding coming available and to make sure that members are aware of what the criteria is, because I noticed a few groups applying for stuff that just quite simply was going to get knocked out right at the very start because it didn't meet the criteria. So I think it would be maybe helpful. It's a, it's a genuine suggestion that if we, we set up a cross-party working group, maybe one member for each party or two, I'm, I'm not precious about it, um, to help drive climate change and to make sure that, that when opportunities come along, that the council is in a good place. So this is a, a green transport uh, schemes that it would be um, the cliche uh, shovel ready. Ah, Councillor Milligan's disappeared. Yes, uh, effectively, it would just be to make sure that there is stuff there that we've already spoke to, to the communities and that, and if the funding becomes available for the Scottish Government or from anywhere else, that we'll have stuff on the shelf ready that we can just pull, pull off. Okay, uh, a lot of people wanted to speak. Is that a proposal for a motion to be uh, addended to, to to this paper? There'd be uh, a cross-party book group. If members, happy, if members are happy with it, Peter, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to have a big debate on that, but I just think it might be helpful. Could I have a seconder then for uh, Councillor Milligan's proposal that we have a cross-party group creating more projects? Uh, Councillor Muirhead, thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious of a number of people, not necessarily in the order I'm seeing them, but Councillor Alexander was wanting to speak quite some time ago. Councillor Alexander. Yes, um, I just want to know what the difference is between a temporary solution and a long-term solution. Surely a temporary solution can then uh, go into a long-term solution. But mm -hmm. also, um, I just wonder what we're doing, what are we doing? And I know that probably SEPA is more um, involved with this, but um, the blue solution so that our rivers are um, a lot cleaner um, and also our green spaces that we are still um, using glyphosate, et cetera, when we could be landscaping our green spaces to enhance our communities um, rather than glyphosating and making them brown and dull. Um, I also think that we should put forward that every new build, whether it be in the private sector or in the um, in the, the non-private sector, should be should have solar panels attached to it. Um, and also, any new building that we put forward should have places where local people can do local things. So we have built a huge estate in Hopefield where there's very little um, space for community activity to take place. And I think that's important as well, keeping um, people within the community so that they don't have to go out to Edinburgh or wherever. Um, so those are proposals that I am putting forward. Thank you, Councillor Alexander. Obviously, the glyphosate debate is going to come back for us. Uh, the community issue at Hopefield, that's a big issue. I wonder if we could just focus on the green transport issues and maybe ask Derek to uh, explain the difference between the short term and the long term. It's a rather philosophical question, I guess, but we have uh, spaces for people and we have places for everyone. They seem to be uh, two different schemes. 
Two, two different things. <laughs> the, the spaces for people was um, created in response to, to the COVID pandemic and to uh, put in almost immediate short term uh, solutions to encourage people to to walk or to take a bike or use mobility scooters, for example. And in doing so, that was to create, um, you may have seen pictures uh, from other authorities using barriers, cones, etc., to cordon off parking bays out with shops, um, to extend the pavement area so people could walk past. Uh, and obviously, uh, in some authority areas, that uh, produced a backlash from local businesses who were, were trying to get back on their feet following uh, the, the lockdown. Uh, and that you compare and contrast that with permanent features, which would be, for example, changing speed limits across the area. Um, and with that, you would have buy-in from the police um, and through our uh, community action team, uh, we'd be able to enforce that because it would come through as a, a permanent solution uh, or a permanent change. And also infrastructure changes. So using um, the tarmac, um, road surface and painting lines. So they, all these become permanent features of uh, roadways, greenways, um, etc. across the area. So that's it covered in a nutshell as quickly as con concisely as I can. Thank you very much. Uh, next on my screen is Stephen, Stephen Curran. Thanks, Provost. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, the order I get is different from the order that Alan Turpey is getting. So I'll, uh, when there's a build up about four, I think we'd better go with Alan. Alan, do you want to get, give the next three or four names in, in order? Thank you, Provost. I've got Councillor Johnston, Councillor Muirhead and then Councillor Curran. Yep, I okay. still also have hands up from councillors Alexander and councillor Milligan. I don't know if that's just legacy issues or if that's supplemental points. Thank you for that. Yep. Uh, so let, let's continue. Councillor Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, one of the recommendations is agree to the establishment of a climate change board to oversee blah, blah, blah. Would, couldn't the councillors from cross party just be involved in that group? And then that would not be another um, meeting that would take up valuable officers time and uh, councillors time and it could all be done at the same time. And the, the other thing is I'm really interested in climate change. I'm a bit of an eco warrior and have been for a long time. But I find reading this um, strategy really quite dry and difficult to read. And I think um, it might be, we want young people to be really, really engaged and working towards that like they are in the rest of the world. So I, I wonder if we could have an abridged version that would be snappy and excite young people into um, participating. It, it's really them we want to involve because it's going to be their world once we're gone. I, I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, we could perhaps ask Derek what the uh, the website presence of this document will will be reduced into, and how we can make it more communicable. And then yeah, the, the yeah. second question is whether a the working group should not just be about green transport issues, but have a wider remit, as Councillor Johnson suggested. Uh, in terms of the the strategy itself, yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to to have planning services and well, being a one council approach, is to have feed in across all the services. Uh, to produce almost like an infographic type uh, to engage um, everyone, not just the, the youngsters within the community, uh, and almost have this as, as the background document as a, a reference um, where required. Um, in terms of the, the working group, I'd be open to have um, a cross-party uh, inclusion in that, um, provided that meets with uh, governments. Uh, does that satisfy Councillor Johnston? Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. But I, I don't know how Derek Milligan feels about that because it was him who suggested a cross party group. I just don't want there to be duplication, especially when we all get tied up in these bank calls, we meetings, etc. Sounds OK to me. OK, so we try and integrate with the ex existing ginger group, if I can call it that, which has already got some uh, very well informed volunteers on it and members of the uh, council staff. Well, OK, thank you, uh, Peter. In that case, we would nominate Diane Alexander to be part of that. 
Okay, as before, there's not been any discussion in my group relative to this for obvious reasons, um, but can we let that stay on the blackboard? Thanks very much. Uh, following that, uh, Councillor Muirhead, then Councillor Curran. Thanks, Provost. Right, speaking as somebody that's been using their bike um, a lot more recently, um, I, I've got to say that I'm, I've got to say it's made me pay attention more to what, what, this, this kind of thing. We, uh, Kath, Kath was at this meeting as well, but the Gorbis Community Council had a meeting um, last week and the, um, there was a, a, a person who had recently moved into, or relatively recently moved into the community, but obviously was from a, um, a, a background of a, a, a being an active cyclist. And he had taken a look around the community and came up to the Community Council with a number of suggestions about some very minor things, some a bit more major about making our community more accessible to people using sustainable transport, using cycling in, part in particular. And it, it was very helpful. And what the community council is looking to do is to get, a, a, as, as, as Derek mentioned, that like an, a, a, a whole range of off the shelf uh, projects uh, that, that are sitting there waiting for funding streams to be made available. So if, if, I think if we have a, a board along the lines that we're, we're talking about that is going to be able to um, actively pursue um, potentially pots of money that the council can, can bid into, then I think that there has to be some way of the local community groups feeding in to, to that board as well and getting their particular projects on that list of potential um, if, if, if projects, because I think that listening to folk at the local level and this is going to be uh, uh, quite paramount. And, and I've got to say that, you know, actually it might be worth trying to get a representative onto that group from, say, Spokes or, or one of the organisations like that who have got a lot of experience across other areas in terms of initiatives and things like that that can be put forward to, um, to, to, to help um, sort of prepare our communities to be more cycling friendly. Yep, well, that's a very helpful contribution. Uh, Stephen Curran. Thanks, Provost. I mean, if we're talking about permanent solutions and we're serious about creating safe cycling routes, reducing emissions, safe pedestrian access, improving traffic flow, we cannot ignore a great separation at Sheriff Hall Roundabout. And it's, I think the onus is on all of us, councillors, to lobby our MSP, Scottish Government, to push forward with that grade separation. Thank you. Uh, I see Councillor Muirhead's hand is up. Oh, on mute. Sorry, it shouldn't have been provost. I should have taken it down. Councillor Henry. Thanks, provost. Uh, while I appreciate we've got ourselves locked into um how people travel you've got to remember that the climate change strategy is a whole lot bigger than that now i appreciate some of the contributions that have been made but to be perfectly honest an active travel working group would actually be better placed to deal with uh with community groups that have uh, got ideas because you've got to remember that they then have to get looked at by officers and, and, and they have to always look at what the funders are going to be saying by way of awards. Now, you know, we went through that, that question answer and Councillor Cassidy opened up by saying, you know, we did nothing in Midlothian and, and everybody else did everything. That's actually fundamentally wrong. What we did is we actually did call upon uh, community groups to come up with ideas. They then have to be assessed by officers and then officers have to f then follow that up by submitting that these bids to uh, Sustran in this case, which were the government agents, I suppose, for the funding. And they have the right to completely um, reject some of these bids and that's what they did. So our officers were very weary, let me add, that in actual fact, putting bids to Sustran that didn't have a hope in getting past Sustran's criteria was a non-starter. Now, that was with the temporary stuff. As far as the, the permanent stuff's concerned, 
then that 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 will go ahead and 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 hopefully we'll get an award on that. But Mr. Oliver is absolutely spot on. We actually proportionally, notwithstanding my frustration and Councillor Hackett's frustration, we actually proportionally got a reasonable deal from what the, the, the bids were. Unfortunately, community groups thought that their project was better than somebody else's. But it's not true to say, and it wasn't just about cycling, may I hasten to add, it's also about pedestrianisation and how we can help people. Remembering that this was when the two metre distancing was all, was all about and how we could get people to get back out again with a safe distance between each other shared alongside uh, uh, those that wanted to cycle. So it's not true to say that that, uh, you know, that wasn't all put uh, into consideration when the officers were putting the bids in. But if we are going to have something like that, I would much rather separate that from the, the climate change board because they're not just going to be dealing with uh, active travel. They're going to be dealing with a whole plethora of things, whether it be, dare I say, solar panels, whether it be better insulation, whether it be looking at fuel poverty. All of that comes into the into the process, including, dare I say, public transport, which again is on an agenda later on uh, today. And it's just about those things. So I would just caution the council uh, about just picking up on one aspect. By all means, have a cross party on, on that aspect and active travel. I don't think anybody would have any problem with that. And that's additional additionality to our own active tra travel strategy that has been endorsed by the council. But we, sh we you know, we shouldn't be j jumping about provost on, did I say on one aspect when there's a whole lot more in our climate change strategy that we've got, got, got to get a hold of. And I'm not having a pop at some cycling group because I've spoken to a number of people uh, on, on the cycling groups and I've said, put forward your suggestions. But putting forward a suggestion, Provost, as we all know, and you never promise you're going to get it, putting forward a suggestion is actually then got to be assessed by our professional officers. And that's where maybe... The, the, you know, that's where maybe there's a, a, a downfall and in, in not, people not saying, oh, by the way, you want to do something, but it will be dependent on the, the professional officers to ensure that if funding is available, we can get it. I'll just, I'll just finish at that. OK, well, there's obviously a tension now here because uh, Councillor Johnson wants to have a sort of holistic approach incorporating these uh, individuals from the individual councillors with the Climate Change Board. Whereas I think you're wanting to have just a, an active travel, uh, perhaps short life working group that will look at building up the uh, reserve of shovel ready projects. Is that a fair analysis? No, Provost. I'm quite happy with, with Councillor Johnson's approach. I think that the okay. board could deal with the overall thing. But what I'm saying, if there's a councillors are desperate to have an active travel working group, then that can be separate from, from the whole climate change strategy. It forms a part of it, but it's not the holistic approach that Councillor Johnson's going about. And that's why I'd rather have the board dealing with the, the holistic side of things. And if people are, are keen as mustard to get active travel on the agenda, do that quite separately. OK, so there is a tension between, between the two. Maybe the subsequent contributions will help on that. On my screen, I see John Hackett. And Colin Cassidy as well, Provost, I think. OK, Colin John Cassidy first, then Colin, if you don't mind. Colin, then John. Colin, then John. Colin, then John. Sorry, John. Uh, the, in reply to Russell there, my frustration came, and to John in a, a certain way, my frustration came through members of the public who had submitted plans, John Hackett, to the council and were rejected outright by our highways department. Now that's what I was told. I even put forward something saying <coughs> we could have similar to the having Edinburgh with the cones on the road to narrow roads so that people could walk on dangerous parts, cycle on dangerous parts, slow the traffic down. Outright object, outright rejection. I am not picking on one particular thing. I am just stating 
that we do not seem to show the ambition that other counties have to get these things done. And John touched on it there by saying he's seen uh, cycle tracks with lampposts in the middle. How the hell did they get money for doing that when we get outright rejected for stuff that there were no lampposts in the middle of the pavements? So, come on, let's get on the script here. Uh, Councillor Hackett. No, I think um, in, in respect to that funding bit, I think what's important is um, looking forward. And as Mr. Oliver has presented, there's an opportunity there for us to look forward. And rather than being temporary solutions, these will be permanent. Um, I know uh, Councillor Cassidy mentioned um, the formation of a local cycling group. I was contacted by them today as well. And I think the proposal from that group is, again, joint party. Um, and I think that's what our residents want to see. I think the residents appreciate the three political groups working closer together. I think on issues like this, particularly more so um, as we have a shared future uh, on this planet, obviously. So I think anything moving ahead where we're out there working together, we're building better communication, better relationships with our communities, bringing their ideas forward and helping it integrate, um, in particular on the active travel side of things, and I agree with Councillor Imri, uh, climate change is much, much wider um, than just active travel. There are groups out there with a great interest in active travel. And as I say, I think we need to work better with them. There's already a proposal there from the community for that to happen. So I would like to see that happening anyway. Um, but I think if you start broadening the board to active travel, the building industry, farming sector, you know, it could get a, a, a little unruly. That is not to say the council can't reach out to these groups. It's about how the board works. So I think I'd propose that we have um, you know, a cross-party group working with council officers, and that will have a oversight over the collective work that the council's doing. Other councillors can get involved in particular areas um, that they have an interest in, and obviously our communities can come forward with the areas that they feel uh, interested in. So, yes, I agree. Cross-party working group. Um, thank you for the strategy, as uh, Council Emery has said. It's great to have a motion at council and um, see actions right on the back of that, in particular, the uh, paper earlier um, with respect to our building standards, which will be a huge step in the right direction. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Emery, your hands up. Uh, are you muted? Your hands down. Uh, OK, there's a proposal here that perhaps isn't satisfactory to Councillor Johnson that we add to this particular decision, a cross-party working group on uh, active travel, obviously related to the green agenda. Uh, does somebody want to propose that? Councillor Imri, Councillor Milligan. Rob, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm quite happy to propose that the, the Climate Change Board deals with the, the, the whole holistic approach, but over and above that, given that there's a, there's a real interest out there in the community that we have a cross-party group just looking at active travel and we can engage with these communities so that we have projects that are ready if funding becomes available to go ahead. Uh, Rona, are you able, able to construe that as a motion? Yeah, I'm just taking a note of that, Provost, thanks. And could I have a seconder? Councillor Hackett, is anyone minded to oppose the motion? Obviously, this group wants to fold itself into the board at some future date. Uh, that could be the case. OK, uh, there being no one opposed to the motion, uh, I'd like to perhaps ask Verona to read out exactly what it is, and then we can proceed. Verona, the are you? The recommendations of the report are, are approved, but you're adding a, an extra recommendation, which is that the, well, to add to the, to the recommendation relating to the cross the Climate Change Board, that it deals with the holistic approach, but you're, you're going to form a cross-party group which would look at active travel with a view to having projects um, already discussed and agreed should there be opportunities available to the council to put in for bids. Excellent, you got it. Okay, everyone happy? We move on to 8.18. 
the Associates of Scotland Regional Deal Joint Committee and the Regional Transport Transition Plan. Uh, that's maybe not correct if there's an officer who'd rather do it. Uh, and Provost, I'm happy to take that one if that's OK. Yeah, okay. Um, so this paper um, is for noting um, and is a record of the paper that was presented to the Edinburgh and South East of Scotland City Deal Joint Committee and approved on the 7th of August. In order to update members, there were five recommendations. Recommendation four was in respect to a collective bid being put into the bus priority fund. And I can now update members to say that we received a letter back on the 18th of August awarding £1.2 million for that. And I'm happy to circulate a copy of the letter, which includes schedule and one which outlines all of the projects that were approved. Happy to circulate that to members for information. I think we'd all benefit from some good news. Please do circulate it. Councillor Emery. Yes, Provost, just to say uh, absolutely supportive of, of the work that was done by the City Region Deal Group. Um, it all came together. We got off, by the way, we got off, just to just to remind people, we actually got off our heels very, very quickly, and the bid was put in, as the chief executive says, pretty smartly, and, you know, out of the, the £3 million that, we, that, you know, the report actually talks talks about, to get £1.2 million in the first phase is absolutely fantastic news and allows us to safely uh, help public transport uh, get back to where it was before uh, COVID-19. And I'm just delighted that we got that money through uh, uh, as quickly, because it will mean that journey times for residents in Midlothian will be enhanced and it will help to get people to use our public transport again. So just hip hip hooray for that. There's not very, as you rightly say, Provost, there's not always many good news stories about at this moment in time. But in this case, it's it's a great news story and it helps with our public transport, which is another part of our agenda uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parry. Uh, thanks, Provost. Yeah, I too uh, welcome that money and um, looking through some of the specific listed projects. I'm really pleased to see um, that there's a proposal in there to change the signal timings and yellow box markings at Straighton Junction. There's been lots of accidents um, in that area over the past few years and it's been a frustration of mine that it's taken this long um, for this to be allocated. Um, unfortunately, in the deliverability boxes, it just says to be confirmed. Um, officers might not know the time scales of that just now, but I would really appreciate uh, somebody getting back to me offline if need be. I'm sure the other ward members would be interested as well to know um, when that was going to be completed. And I guess just another thing to say, particularly from a Midlothian West perspective, and I appreciate that we're in a bit of a different situation in terms of public transport, but I always feel like our um, park and ride systems um, in the whole region actually are hugely um, underused and I would like to see more development of those proposals. I think it's it's absolutely absurd that we've got um, people living in, in Lone Head and uh, along the A701 corridor who get a bus into town um, to get out to the end of the bypass um, when, when really actually if we joined up our public transport and used the bypass we could perhaps stop it um, being like a car park most of the time and you know that infrastructure is already there. Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of creative thinking to start looking at that. Now, I know that the um, bypass park and ride shuttle system was used initially when those park and rides were open and it was seen at the time that the demand wasn't there. But I think that's something that we should be uh, looking at again um, because the demand is there and everybody that tries to get along that bypass at various times of the day uh, will tell you that. So um, good news on, the, on that project. But if there's a kind of steer into further projects, I think that's uh, certainly something that would be uh, or should be taken into consideration. Thank you for that. Uh, I can see John Hackett's hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Provost. I, I don't want to go back um, over history again, but just again reflecting on some of the negative comments the council did get around the spaces for people bid, I think it is important to really highlight the, the really positive work in getting this bid as well. And it's to, a message to the community that we do take this issue really seriously and we will go for the money um, where we're able to get it. Thank you for that. 
OK, with a positive note, we move from the public papers to the, the private ones. Uh, I don't think we've got any uh, guests uh, online at the moment. So if any of you have any 